I will be um, delivering two lectures um, uh, and devoted to the research we have done, or a part of the research of the group we have done in the last, I would say, four or five years on active pneumatics, uh, experimental active pneumatics. Um, the way I have organized uh, these two presentations is uh, I have divided it into, into several, seven actually, seven sections, uh, each one with uh, its own perspective, its own question behind. And, uh, but as a wall, I hope I can give you a picture, a global picture of what we have done in, the, in this field of, of, of active pneumatics. Actually, uh, I haven't done anything uh, actually, the work has been done for by many other people, and I would like to acknowledge all of them. Um, first of all, m most part of what I will be presenting is uh, uh, the PhD work of Paul Guillemar, who uh, started uh, this subject. Actually, uh, we sent him to, uh, to Brandeis University where the material I will be referring to was proposed and, um, and he learned the way to do it. So what is this? I mean, it's... <laughs> I'm going to get out of this now. Anyway, um, so as I said, um, Paul Guillemat is the first uh, actor of this, of this story. Uh, now, uh, Paul Guillemat is in Geneva and uh, two other people are continuing uh, this work, uh, Jerome Hadwin and uh, Marie Curie, uh, PhD, and Berta Martinez, who is sitting here. You probably know, because she normally uh, shows her up. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, behind the scene, behind everything, is Jordi Ines Muyol, a whole old collaborator, uh, who is, uh, whose expertise is, was more on liquid crystals, and as you will see, it's, it's really very important, but because uh, most of the underlying topic uh, will be on liquid crystals, either active or non-active. Okay, um, as I said, this will be a little bit uh, the outline of the presentation. The what? The sound down? Okay, perfect. Sound is not there anymore. Let's try. Okay, <laughs> maybe it's better. Uh, okay, the, so these are the um, several sections. I have uh, divided these these two seminars, uh, going from well, some kind of introduction to experimental active systems. Actually, I do not need probably to introduce the topic too much here, but anyway, uh, I think it's, it could be uh, interesting. Maybe some of the ex uh, experimental context I will mention you, you don't know about, so it's interesting. I will focus a little bit more on protein-based active systems because actually this is the kind of system I will be um, talking about. Then uh, I will present exactly the, the system, this uh, microtubule kinesin active system, uh, which is on the, the, the system I will be referring to. Uh, and then I will consider different situations, different scenarios, as I said, with different questions behind. For example, first, uh, what is the most, one of the most prototypical concepts in this context, which is this active tubulant. I don't know if you have, if you have heard about it before or somebody here has talked about. Anyway, I will also talk a little bit about active tubulant, the characterization and the onset or what, would, what we think is the um, mechanism that leads to these active turbulence. Then I will go to laterally confined active pneumatic, uh, just discussing a little bit channels and annular rings. Then I will go to some to some considerations on the role of the in, I mean I mean this active pneumatic essentially will be prepared as an interface so somehow it's important to to understand better the role of the contacting fluid there 
So first I will do it with uh, a normal oil, isotropic oil, but mostly I will concentrate on interfacing, interfacing this active pneumatic with a, with a passive liquid crystal because you will see that there are many, many objects there and I will discuss this in these last two, last two uh, sections. Um, by the way, um, two things. First, um, I am very used to give, uh, not <laughs> seminars, well, I, 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 I give quite a number, but I am quite used to, to teach <laughs> And Berta, who was my student some years ago, will, uh, um, will uh, uh, recognize that I always insist to the people to ask questions. Okay? I, I think this makes uh, the presentation much more uh, lively and much more interesting. So don't hesitate to uh, stop me at any point. And I, I mean, uh, uh, there are more than 120 transfer uh, slides here. <laughs> But if I finish with 60, it's perfectly okay. So nobody will, I hope, <laughs> will, will tell me that I have not done my, my duty. So I, I insist, just feel free, ask questions. Second, uh, I have prepared some notes because the organizers here asked me, to, well, ask us to prepare some notes and I have them ready. Um, I will ask uh, Julian to, uh, the way to the way to uh, to uh, load upload to the uh, web page or something, so it's ready. Ah, there are more or less twenty pages. This I am not used to. I don't like. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me make a little bit of propaganda. <laughs> uh, just two weeks ago, uh, a review paper co-authored with uh, Julia and other people, people in Oxford and in Barcelona, appear in that comic, kind of review on active pneumatic. So I suggest you to, if you are interested, you can go there in the comic. Okay, so first, context. Experimental active systems and specially protein based. Well, I will uh, start with um, living realizations, and uh, one of the most remarkable uh, realizations of uh, an active pneumatic is uh, cell tissues. I, I, I shouldn't say anything about it because uh, John Francois is here, and everything I say, probably he will say no. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, um, cell tissues. Uh, is, is a really a extreme example of an active pneumatic. And the nice thing is that this is not an idea that comes, that has come very recently. Actually, uh, some observations um, like 50 years ago already suggested some sort of, uh, or, or suggested the idea to use pneumatic concepts or the concept of liquid crystal, of normal liquid crystal to, to be applied uh, to cell tissues. So the idea is not, is not really new, but what is new is the new perspective, the new well-dedicated experiments, very well done experiments by many groups. And the nice theories behind these experiments that uh, uh, permit uh, to understand better the experimental system and in the same time to try to predict new things from the theory behind, using the theory normally of, of active gels or active pneumatics. Um, uh, apart from these uh, very old, very classical uh, examples, I mentioned three papers that appear more or less in a row <laughs> last year in 2017 by different groups. Silvia Zan, if uh, Giovanni was there, Sano, uh, Ladu, uh, Sano was with you, Julia, you were also participating in this paper. Or oh, Ladu, Ladu. So three different papers on these cell tissues. Each one is has its own perspective, but what is interesting is that, if I understand correctly, in all three, they stress the importance of defects. And defects, as you will see, is a kind of, rec will be a persistent concept behind my presentation and actually behind 
and you study on active and active. So uh, it's, 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 it's interesting to, to really emphasize this point. I mean, uh, new perspectives on these health issues just emphasize the role of these active groups. Now, more, um, oops, sorry. Other realizations of active matter, oh, sorry, I should go, uh, not, uh, exactly, here. Uh, leading, uh, still leading realizations, for example, um, is a bacteri uh, turbulent, um, sorry, bacterial, bacterial suspensions. And here I show, there will be a lot of videos here. If somebody is interested, I can just share the videos. I mean, these videos not made by all public, but anyway, if somebody is really interested, because some of them, even aesthetically, they are very nice. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this is a, a suspension of uh, bacteria, uh, E. coli, in the interface between air and water. And you can see this kind of collective motion of this organism, uh, which is one of the characteristics that we know of the active matter. Um, also, for example, here, uh, this is another example uh, of uh, some unicellular organism or whatever multicellular organism multicellular plant it shows it's a ball box it also it shows also some kind of cell organization from elementary movements okay going to non-living as, as I said I, I just uh, I just leave for a little bit later the because they made the set realizations but um, just going to non-living realizations for example I hear um, uh, show show um, examples very well known examples actually for example for granular matter and actually if I am correct these were the f practically among the first examples of collective behavior that were referred in this context of active matter actually active here it's a little bit to my understanding, it's a little bit misleading because actually these systems are driven. But in any case, I mean, the presence of collective motion, uh, cell organization at the scales which are, which are much larger than the typical length scale of the individual unit, or for example, other signatures of active matter, for example, uh, anomalous density fluctuations, uh, special correlations already appear here. Eh? And for example, in this, this is also a video. Okay, should be. Um, a video showing um, a bi vibrated uh, spheres, and among these spheres, you disperse some rods. And what you see is the behavior of these rods just being dispersed by these blah, 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 blah. Um, vibrating uh, spheres. Now, colloids. Colloids is a huge field where people uh, look at as an active matter system. And I mentioned, uh, for example, a particular class of colloids, uh, probably you already know, or at least some of you, or probably they have uh, people here that have been lecturing on this, I don't know. But anyway, uh, this special class uh, are called um, Janus colloids. Janus colloids, as you know or not, anyway, um, are colloids which have heterogeneous uh, composition, in particular, for example, two phases. And in these two phases, from these two phases, actually, you trigger some kind of fluoresces, which can be electrically induced, diffusion induced, acoustical induced, whatever. And there are many examples of this. In the literature, this is a huge field of research from many, many people. I mentioned here two of, two of these contexts. For example, this is a very nice example of a kind of genus colloid just propagate because swimming, let's say, based on chemical reactions. Uh, but there are other, for example, in, in the right, at the right, there is an example induced by light. And actually, in this, <laughs> I have taken this from a review of modern physics recently published by 
fetching that was lecturing here a few days ago. And from this review for the physics that I uh, personally advise you to, to, to go in if you are interested, there is a list, as you can see here, a table of very different uh, uh, colloids which are swimmers and so considered as active matter realizations. Another example, who I'm sure uh, they pr it was presented to you, is the quinker quinker rotators. Okay, quinker rotators. I don't need them to explain. I just show a video. I'm sure also you have seen. But this is a video of a collective motion of these of these quinker rotators. Uh, that was uh, prepared in the group of Janusz Wasek. Uh, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot uh, resist <laughs> to present something which is, again, maybe not completely active, is somehow driven colloid, but for sure is a kind of uh, a system where you can see this kind of collective behavior of colloids, and it's, uh, it's something we have done in our group. It's another completely different, well, not completely different actually, but different research project, and it consists of colloids dispersed in liquid crystal, and just theoretically, uh, electrophoretically, actually, I mean, driven by an electric field, in that sense, it's not active by themselves. But these colloids also are able to assemble, to rotate, to reconfigure, to whatever, whatever you want. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that in these two lectures, but if somebody is interested in this particular context of research, I have not 120 <laughs> slides, but quite a number, <laughs> and I can show you in detail what we are doing, what we want to do, which is also very interesting, but a little bit different from what, what I will be presenting. Now, these are active matter scenarios from living, non-living systems, but as I said, I just uh, skipped up to now living systems, or let's say systems based on living components, uh, and in particular I will be referring to protein-based realizations, okay? And in, the, in this field, uh, the, the first, somehow, the first paper or the first report on some kind of organization of uh, proteins, filament, uh, uh, proteins based on a filament, essentially, is a paper, a celebrated paper by Thomas Sarray and uh, Netherleg, which was published just 17 years ago. And I have taken a picture of this paper, which is this picture, essentially to show that uh, although in this paper it was uh, emphasize the fact that when you were using, uh, in this case, when you were, when you use, uh, or when these guys use microtubules, which will be the central, one of the central protagonists of, of my talk, and some motors, again, a central actor in this story, you can have self-organization. You can have patterns with very well-defined characteristics, as for example, here I show you kind of asters or kind of uh, swirling uh, patterns, uh, a, spiral a spiral pattern, things like that. And this was published 17 years ago, which is quite remarkable. Now, the community working with this uh, kind of proteins, essentially, or the community uh, where these kind of systems are considered as active matter systems, uh, essentially devoted a lot of efforts to uh, motility assays. 
which are uh, quite simple to, well, quite simple, I don't know, I've never done them, but probably are very, let's say, robust and simple to run. And uh, a very, a very, um, let's say, a very important uh, group uh, doing this kind of uh, uh, motility assays is a group by Bose. Uh, first in Munich, now in the States. And in 2010, they published a, a also a very nice paper on actomyosin motility assays. Now, I explain you, for those of you who don't know about what is a motility assay, it's, a, it's really a very clear concept. Normally, normally, when you have this kind of filament-based proteins and motor proteins, Normally, the way you consider is that the proteins, they walk on this kind of uh, uh, filament-based uh, proteins, microtubules, for example, or actins, or whatever. Now, in the, in the motility assay, the situation is reversed. You uh, stack your motors in a solid surface, and then you put your microtubules or your whatever, your filament proteins on top of them or in between them and then since the motor cannot move because it's really stuck what happens is that it makes the filament proteins move and then what you see is the motion not of the motors but of the microtubules or of the actins or whatever that so it's the reverse of a canonical let's say actin uh, motility assay but uh, still the idea is the same. It's some active system organizing or self-organizing patterns, the structures of these proteins. And actually these guys were able to detect and to uh, report uh, pneumatic structures, polar, because in this case actin is polar, and in different kind of structures, clusters, swills, bands, which are orders of magnitude larger than the constituents of this particular system. Now, these motility assays can also be done with uh, tubuling. And then the motor has to be different. I mean, it cannot be myosin, but in this case, it's dying. It is another motor protein. And you have the same, it's the same system, but just changing the motor and the uh, and, uh, uh, filament protein, and you have this nice, in this case, large scale lattices of vortices, organizing around, moving around, and this was published also some time ago by Sununo. Now we come close to our system. And the uh, first contestant of our system is a paper that appeared published by the same group, by Dogic group, on uh, microtubules and kinesin. And these two will be the central components of our system. And these people reported a situation where they were able to replicate somehow to mimic the cilia beating. Cilia are this kind of a small, how to say this, extensions of the membrane of some protozoa, whatever. And you know that they are very important because they move and they organize collective flows, and this is something was pretty much studied. Now, uh, these guys um, in Brandeis, they were able to propose this kind of minimal replica of these cilia based on these microtubules and motors. And now I come to the central paper. Without that paper, I will not be here. And I recognize that. Without this paper, this research, for no, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I have to be honest. <laughs> so this is the paper that inspired us a lot. Actually, I remember I was visiting Brandeis uh, maybe five, six years ago, but actually I was visiting, uh, not uh, Dominic Dodgic, but I was visiting Seth Fraden because this guy I know 
I know him from many, many years in liquid crystals. Uh, and Seth Fraden said, oh, Francis, you should go to the lab of uh, Tony Zidozzi because he's doing very nice things. And I said, why not? And since that point, I think my, my life changed. <laughs> well, I am a little bit dramatic, but, well, you know. Uh, it's true. I discover a system that passions me, and, uh, and I got in love with this system from the very beginning from the first time I saw it, which is something maybe a little bit dangerous. But anyway, in, this in that case, I think it's not dangerous. OK, so this is the system published there, Nature uh, 2002, 470 or near 500 citations, which is not bad. And these guys were considering the idea to prepare an active system based on uh, self-assembling of microtubules and shearing, internally shearing these microtubules with Tynesen motors. And the possibilities of this system are huge, as you will see, and, and we have uh, worked a lot on, on, on this system for the last five or few years. So this finished the first part. This was the introduction. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Let's go. How is my time? So I have seven, so three. Is one hour and a half? OK. Now, the system. I will explain with all the detail the system. I never explained this with that detail. So I had to learn a lot myself. <laughs> I, I was working yesterday and today, this morning, just present, preparing this presentation. OK. There are essentially uh, four components, I would say, of the system. And uh, let's, let's take each one. Microtools, motors, kinesin. These kinesins, actually, they work in a cluster way. So they are clustered. Normally, two kinesins are clustered by a, a streptavidin, which is a Linta. And then there are two more components. One which is very, very important is PEG, polyethylene glycol. That's a chemical compound which is very important, as you will see in the following uh, slides. And finally, the fourth very important component is ATP. ATP is the fuel. Is, the, is what fits the kinesin and make these motors move. Uh, so ATP is also very important. Now, I will take them separately, OK? And I will explain each one. This is from, <laughs> as you can recognize, this is from internet. <laughs> it's the first time in my life I copy <laughs> directly from the internet something. Anyway, um, these are the microtubules. Microtubules are proteins made of filaments of proteins. Here, uh, what is interesting to, to emphasize is that these microtubules are composed of dimers. These dimers correspond to different forms of tubulins. Tubulins will be a monomer, and the microtubule will be a polymer. So it's really a polymerization of the, of the tubulin. Now, these two dimers, they organize in a kind of helical way, forming a filament. This filament is very dynamically unstable. So it polymerizes and depolymerizes, and everything is controlled by GTP, GDP, as far as I understand. Now, in our case, uh, OK, and by the way, I, I give you here some numbers, because it's always important to have numbers here. So in principle, the microtubules can be very long. Actually, the persistent length is very, very high. Can be up to 50 microns. Now, the, the dimensions of these, of these circles of these uh, tubules is like uh, between 24 
exterior radius and or diameter, sorry, sorry, and 12 for the inner diameter. Okay, these are the rules. Oh, I cannot resist to show you this. I'm pretty sure who, who of you have seen this video? Okay, I skip it. not well prepared for this microphone. Is that okay? Okay. Depletion. These microtubules will get assembled. Okay? And to assemble them, rather than to use some very complicated chemical stuff, we just use a very basic physical principle, which is the depletion depleting action. Probably all of you know about depletion. I just remember very briefly. Uh, the depletion in this case is uh, is due to this PG and in that sense it's very important and the depletion means essentially that when you have these polymers like this uh, small uh, things there and these polymers are dispersed in contact with some big colloids. Now these polymers want to have free s solvent to dissolve. So the idea is that if they make the colloids close, then the, the, the s uh, regions around the colloids which are not reachable by the by the polymer, they overlap. And in that sense, by making the colloids contact, the polymers have much more free volume to dissolve because you overlap the, the un unaccessible regions around each colloid. This is the principle of depletion, and this is known for many, many years. This is can be interpreted as an entropic effect, and actually there are many, many cases to make. Now, this, in our case, is also very important. Why is that important? Well, microtubules under the action of this PEG, they assemble and they form bundles. Each uh, filament is uh, of the order of 1.5 micron, each individual filament, and this is very important. Now, to get this, we have we have to use a kind of chemical compound which avoids the polymerization and depolymerization of the microtubules. So somehow we tune the polymerization, depolymerization of the system in order to keep this 1.5 micron filament. Now these filaments, as I said, they are bundled under the depleting action of the PEG. And what is important is the following. These microtubules have some polarity. So there is a minus, a plus, a minus sign there. Now, imagine that you have two microtubules come together and a motor is now, actually two motors, two tiny things motors, will walk on this pair of microtubules. Now, the kinesins, essentially, they move towards the plus end. Now, if these two filaments, they have the same polarity, now the, the kinesin will move, but will not introduce any internal shear in the system. Otherwise, if the microtubules are polarity unsorted, so they, are, they have opposite polarity, now when this kinesin move, they will introduce some internal shear at the level of these two microtubules. Now imagine this, not for two microtubules, but for a bundle of microtubules. And obviously, it's very unlikely that all the, not all the microtubules there will be polarity sorted. So actually, my understanding of the system is that the system is active because it's permanently, permanently looking 
for being polarity short, but they are the system is never polarity short. And what happens then is that these bundles stretch under the action of these motors, they battle, they fracture, they recombine, and you get a permanently renovated system, which is the active gel I will be considering. And it is permanently renovated as soon as you have ATP, obviously, because ATP, again, as I said, is the fuel for these motors. So that it you should also consider uh, to have enough ATP. In our system, what we have is a regenerator of ATP. So ATP is, consum is, is consumed to ADP, but we have a regenerator, so our experiments might long for hours. Okay? Now, in this case, I'm, I'll show you again this. These are the microtubules. These are the depleting action of the PEG. Uh, these are the motors, two motors, and this uh, circle is the, what I call you, the cluster, the cluster of the study beam. And what you have is essentially this active gel. So this, what you see here, is the polarizing microscopy because some of these tubulins are level with with uh, some fluorescent tag, and what you see here is the fluorescent image of this active gel. This is prepared in water. No problem with that, and you see, or I hope uh, you have seen, that. Um, as I said, this system is continuously being buckled, extended, fracture, whatever, recombine. Now, this is very nice, but I think this is even better. Now, what is this? The previous image correspond to a an active gel, so it's a 3D system, it's a bulk system. Now the system is very nice, the active gel is very nice, but the problem is somehow that is very, the, the density is very low, it's a very heterogeneous system, and we, we wanted, well actually Dozik and company <laughs> wanted to have a much more dense system. Now the idea is simple, you just you, you must densify the system. Now, how do we densify this active gel? We accumulate the active gel into an interface. Well, that's the way, I mean, it's very easy. If all what you have in the volume, you project and you, you deplete into a, an interface, then the system obviously much, will be much denser. And this is what these guys did. They use an interface with oil, oil water. Water is the active gel medium, and the oil is just to create the interface where you will go to the bleed, you will go to condense this active material. So from now on, <laughs> all what I will be explaining here will correspond to a 2D system or quasi 2D system. Always I will consider the layer of active, mat of active material at the interface between water, when it was created. Actually, that active material is created in the bulk and later goes to the interface. But always I will consider the active material living at the interface between water and some oil, cute. Exactly, I wanted to go into that. Actually, to get this, we use not only PEC at the bulk, but we also use PEC at the interface. Actually, the interface is stabilized with a surfactant which has PEC. So PEC is everywhere. That's true. 
it's it's funny but it's true if we don't use a peg based surfactant we have used a lot of different surfactants but if we don't use a peg based surfactant you don't get that no well essentially i understand that this is a kind as i said it's a kind of mm, promoted depletion from from the peg at the interface Probably, probably some kind of depleting. No, I, I am not saying that is PEC. I am not saying it's not, it's a specific of PEC. What I am saying is that the it probably is a specific of some depleting agent. So we have used always as a depleting uh, PEC. And uh, it's also true, another thing which is interesting related to your question on is that if the system is not active, it doesn't go to the interface. So the system must be active first and then the interface must be sterilized with some peg based surfactant. Otherwise, you don't have this. Please. I know. You mean it's a question of buoyancy effect that get keep may well be, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Maybe we Oh you should tell me then because it's something we don't understand actually why it goes to the interface. <laughs> but it goes. Um sure, please, please. Uh, well, well, monolayer. <laughs> that's a that's a good point. Um we have tried very, very hard, very, very hard to observe the thickness and it is really very difficult i i think i can show you actually here well i don't know if you see it very well but anyway this is the process of accumulation at the interface and you can see can i move here yes you can see that this is the thickness of this boundary layer. Now, how, how thick is that? It's a little bit difficult to, to, to give precise numbers, but I will say it should be of the order of a few microns. Mm, it's thick. Are you, do you agree? It's much thicker. No, that's for sure. No, no, that's for sure. The microtubule is nanometer scale. No, no, but this is this is an accumulation of bundle. Yeah, exactly. By the way, this is the process of accumulation, so it takes minutes, not not a few minutes to accumulate into the interface. Now, uh, this we call active pneumatic, and I think the. the the way to qualify it is very appropriate, it makes sense. I mean, this is a system which shows long range orientational order. So it's animatic. <laughs> well, depends, depends. I mean, you, I mean, this might be 50 microns. It's not long, it's not, ah, no, I mean, <laughs> Microtubules are, as I said, 1.5. The thickness should be the thickness of the of that layer should be around maybe a few microns. Um, anyway, I, I see some orientational order here, sure, <laughs> and you also see. <laughs> okay, now. Uh, another characteristic of this that you sure you have uh, uh, observed is the presence of defects. Obviously, in referring to liquid crystals always are defects, but there is a very important difference with normal liquid crystals. In normal classic liquid crystals, defects tend to annihilate, and the system tends to relax to a, to a state, to a configuration with 
a few defects, or if possible, this is not a defect at all. Now here, defects are continuously created and destroyed. And there are in sheer stresses, very local, that create these defects, and they unbind, and Julia, and other people have studied this in much detail. But the idea is that defects are always present, and this you should keep in mind. Um, now, defects in this case, uh, this is, a, by the way, this is a schematic 2D, so essentially, essentially defects should be semi-integer. So uh, the two kind of defects normally, or at least the half-integer defects are the, the, um, the less energetic, um, the two kinds of defects are called plus one half, minus one half. Plus one half is this kind of parabolic shape, and minus one half is this kind of triangular or three hole or whatever. By the way, another question is the following. In principle, due to the symmetry of these defects, plus one half defects are motile, minus one half defects are not motile by themselves. They are always entrained by the flows, but in principle, they do not. Um, this is the second part. <laughs> Questions? Is that clear, the system? Please, you. Ah, no, no, that's important. Uh, yeah, yeah, very good, very good, very good, very good. <laughs> very good, yes. No, 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 that's true. I mean, when we refer to defects here, we are a little bit uh, f fuzzy or fuzzy or whatever. I mean, defects in liquid crystals, in conventional liquid crystals, are singularities in the orientational field, okay? So here, defects for us, and in this community, at least as far as I understand, are regions devoid of the active material. And, and in that sense, you look at, like, a little bit black. So it's not that there is a in a sense, it's not that there is a continuous orientational field and then there are some singularities, some, uh, some points of conflict there, as in normal liquid crystals. So here we understand a defect as some uh, region which is devoid of... That's what you were asking, right? Yes, that's very good. Thanks. Now, since I will be referring a lot to liquid crystals, either active or passive, and I don't know exactly your knowledge of liquid crystals, I have there to prepare a sort of four or five transparency uh, slides on minimal concepts of liquid crystals, okay? Are you familiar with liquid crystals? Who, who is familiar with liquid crystals here? There, there, there. Well, good, but uh, still I think it's worth going into that. So the minimal, the minimal. <laughs> Minimal concept, okay? <coughs> Thermotropic liquid, th liquid crystals are classified essentially into two big groups. One is called thermotropic liquid crystals. The other one, the other big family is leotropic liquid crystals. Now, thermotropic liquid crystals is very easy to remember. Thermotropic liquid crystals are single components, are oils, essentially. Leotropic liquid crystals are not single components. Normally, they are based on dispersions of surfactants or things like that, but always there are more than one component. So there are not pure components, contrary to thermotropic liquid crystals. Normally, I will be referring to thermotropic liquid crystals, uh, but at some point also... Uh, but actually, for example, the, 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 the active pneumatic should be in my view, considered as a kind of leotropic liquid crystals, actually, <laughs> because it's a dispersed system, actually. Anyway, thermotropic liquid crystals. Um, uh, the idea is that these materials, these fluids, are anisotropic, either thermotropic or leotropic, they are anisotropic, and they organize in phases, in phases which have some orientational order. And so here, this is a slide I have taken from my master course. <laughs> I teach this to my master students, so I'm sorry for that. You are grown up, <laughs> but uh, still it's not bad sometimes to remember past things. Anyway, so these are, these are the phases, typical phases of liquid crystals, of thermotropic liquid crystals. Uh, these are the two 
typical phases, intermediate mesophases between the orderly uh, solid crystal and the completely disordered isotropic system or uh, phase. And the two phases are called smectic, where you find some kind of orientational order and some kind of layer structure, so some degree of positional order, at least at the level of the wave uh, back the perpendicular to these layers, and the pneumatic. The pneumatic uh, liquid crystal, the pneumatic phase is just a average orientational order, but without any kind of positional order, not layer structures, anything. Now, as you can imagine, when you increase the temperature from the solid state, first you go to the smectic and then to the pneumatic. Sometimes, sometimes, not all the compounds have uh, shows the, as far as I understand, as I know, not all of them shows the two phases, but some of them, and I will present a particular one which shows a smectic at a lower temperature and a pneumatic phase at a, s a little bit higher temperature. Now, another thing of a uh, pneumatic, of pneumatic phase, is to characterize this pneumatic order. And here I just show you uh, just the difference in terms of this, prob uh, this uh, probability distribution function, the difference between a crystal structure and some kind of isotropic or pneumatic, isotropic liquid or pneumatic. I uh, skip this. Uh, this is just for fun. <laughs> to my students in the master course, I always ask them, um, apart from these smectic and pneumatic phases, could you tell me other phases which could be proper <laughs> to a thermotropic liquid crystal, and they always come a little bit, um, you know, into trouble. And then I take, I don't know if I can do it here, but I can take some of these uh, pieces, a lot of them, and then I show to the student, just try to arrange them into some kind of orientation order. And when I ask them this, to do this, they come with really different phases, and some of them are real, real uh, liquid crystal phases. And here, I, I, don't, I don't ask you to do it, because it might take some time, but you can think yourself to try to organize this kind of rod. Now, this is the pneumatic phase. This is the smectic I was referring to. But, well, at least I will put you a question. Could you imagine another phase of the smart, a smectic type? No, come on. <laughs> come on, you are a very old, um, very well-known professor. <laughs> <laughs> no? Well, well, exactly, exactly. You have to consider that you, I mean, these molecules could, be s could have some tilt with respect to the normal to the layer, right? <laughs> and this is exactly what happens. So you can have this. Could you imagine another version of that? Exactly. <laughs> chunk, 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 chunk. Why not? <laughs> I mean, and there are much more complicated phases like these ecstatic phases with some sort of ecstatic order when you project the molecules into the planes. Very complicated, actually. <laughs> now, the last thing I want to show you uh, concerning concept, basic, basic concept of liquid crystal is the responsive nature of these materials. These materials, these liquid crystals are very, very responsive. Responsive to everything. Responsive to electric fields, responsive to magnetic fields, responsive to uh, kind of uh, light or irradiation, response to shear flows, or shear forces, uh, everything. And always you have to consider that since this material is anisotropic by nature, the responses will be anisotropic also, as well. So instead, for example, of referring to uh, the electric constant, you have to refer to a dielectric tensor. And in that sense, you have to refer to a polarizability or the electric anisotropy in the sense of the, uh, of the director and in the perpendicular direction to the director. So uh, always you have to imagine that this is really very, very important, the way it responds to electric or magnetic fields. For example, just to, to be very brief, if somebody tells you this material has 
positive dielectric anisotropy, it means essentially that this component parallel is to the direct is larger than the perpendicular. And this means that the molecules will tend to orient following the applied electric field. Now, if somebody tells you this material has negative dielectric anisotropy, it's just the contrary. The material will, will tend to align perpendicular to the applied electric field. Okay? And this is a characteristic of the, of, the material of the liquid crystal you are considering. So when you buy a liquid crystal, one of the basic specifications is the positive or negative, and then obviously the, the intensity of the, of the value. But the, the, the sign of, the of this value is very, very, uh, the, the sign of these dielectric uh, properties are diamagnetic properties also are very, very important. Now, the last thing, sorry, the last thing is defects. <laughs> I already mentioned defects, so defects is a classical topic in liquid crystal, in conventional liquid crystal, and here uh, I assign to different defects a number. What is this number? Minus one, minus one half. I mentioned already somehow, but what is this number? Winding number? Exactly. So you have discovered that essentially this comes from the orientation of the mm -hmm. liquid crystal around the defect. Uh, actually, this is called topological charge, or it's normally it's called this way. Now, the, the, the precise number corresponds, as you said, to the, to the number of turns of 2 pi that you follow when you, sorry, that you create on, well, you create, you reproduce in your orientation when you follow a closed path around the defect. So in this case, you can do with your, uh, with this. So you, you start with this, and then you do clack, 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 clack. So you rotate two pi, but counterclockwise. And this means that the number is minus one, the topological charge. Here, you rotate by two pi, but in the same time, in the same sense that the paths are on the defect. So in this case, the topological charge is one plus one, actually. And these are the two cases, minus one half and plus one half, which are the two basic <laughs> defects in our active material. Is that clear? Good. OK, so this is the second part, I think. <laughs> Questions? I go very slowly. Maybe I go too slow. Maybe. No? Okay, perfect. If I go too slow or too fast, just tell me. Okay, so first, unconfined active pneumatics. Well, unconfined. Unconfined up to a certain point. I mean, uh, you confine it somehow, but uh, you confine, as I, I will explain in a second, in a pool, in a very big pool. Now, the big difference between, between our, our experimental design and uh, Dogic experimental design is that Dogic use, used always a closed cell to glass plates, and they, they prepare the active material there. Well, in our case, we always use open cells, and this is f for very, very, very uh, reason uh, that you will understand very easily. Because in this way, we have a better control on the, on the interface, actually, on the way we prepare the interface, on the way we tune the interface, on the way we, uh, we reconfigure the interface. So we always, from the very beginning, we decided to go into this design. And this is the design we use. So we, this is a PDMS block. And in this block, we drill some hole. And in this hole, we put the aqueous gel first, active gel, and then on top of it, we just pour some, in principle, oil, normal isopropic oil, not oil of the one in the restaurant, eh? <laughs> silicon oil, <laughs> but I'm sure they will, it will work as well. Now, this is the, uh, gives, I give you a little bit the dimensions, so the lateral dimension is five millimeters, which is really pretty large. 
pretty big. Yeah. Now, the, ob the first obvious thing is to interface this material with an, with an oil, with a silicon oil. Okay? And when you do that, by the way, here I show you the surfactant we use. This pluronic is based on PEG, eh? PEG based surfactant. And when you do that, the first thing you observe is something which is nice. What do you observe here? Which is nice, I think, to me. This is, as you can recognize, the active pneumatic I showed you before. And this is the oil. The oil with dispersed particles. And you see tra tracer particles. And you see that the motion is transferred from the active layer to the passive phase. And this is very, very important. It could have been that this oil will just keep at rest. Well, probably not, actually. <laughs> But, uh, in any case, it's interesting to see that really the momentum is transferred from the active layer to the passive one. And when you have these tracers, then you can do whatever you want, because you can trace the flows and you can get velocity fields, you can get vorticity fields, and you can get everything. You can get correlation of the velocity fields, correlation of the vorticity fields, you can get whatever you want. You can uh, study dispersions, you can uh, study whatever. I will not go too much into this, because first, because I don't have much time, <laughs> and second, we haven't uh, uh, taken too much, uh, paid too much attention to that. I will concentrate on another topic, which is active turbines. Now, this material, when you look at it, actually is quite irregular, I will say, no? I mean, this this um, this state is quite irregular. Seems kind of chaotic or whatever, random. But in fact, there is... Uh, please. The system is not completely 2D, that, that's for sure. But, but I, don't, I don't quite see your question, sorry. We are, look, we are looking, yeah. Ah, you mean the defects. Uh, mm, no, because I can see, actually the defect itself probably has some <laughs> some thinness itself. I mean, it's, it's not a point, actually, it's a region. And it's a region probably also with some, I will imagine, some thinness. Oh, sure. No, that's for sure. That, that's absolutely sure. Now, as I said, this is a kind of very regular pattern, but at the same time, you recognize some coherence here. The flows are organized somehow somehow with some length scale, or within some length scale. And this is something, it was proposed uh, in a paper by Luca Giomi, who really considered the, desc the statistical description of these active turbulence for active pneumatic. And he proposed that if you look at the distribution of these vortices, of the size of the vortices, you should find some sort of exponential distribution, some sort of exponential decay with some characteristic length scale. That was the prediction of that paper, okay? So we decided first to look at this prediction and we compute the, 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 the vortex size in terms of this Okubo Weiss parameter. I will not enter into the details. If somebody is interested, I can give you details on this, but this is just the way we compute the vertical uh, area, let's say. Places where this occupable vice is less than zero are considered vertical, vertical areas. And this is our, our experimental results. So here we plot the number of vortices in terms of the area, and this is a fit with an exponential. And I think you will recognize that the fit is wonderful. It's really amazing. It's very nice. Uh, the orders of magnitude is not, I mean, the range is limited obviously by, by, by our experiment, but uh, still you go from something like 300 
micron squared to more than 2,500, which is not bad. So it's near one order of magnitude, which is quite quite good, I, I would say. And, by the way, and the exponential this exponential uh, distribution is predicted to go or to to feature an active length scale. Actually, this active length scale is with which gives you this kind of coherence, and this concept will appear, this active length scale will appear many, many times during my talk, today and tomorrow. And it is given in terms, at, at least in the theoretical paper, in terms of a ratio between two important quantities. One is K. K is the elasticity of the material, time of a stiffness, time of elastic constant of a thermotropic liquid crystal, divided by alpha. Alpha is, in this kind of approaches, is the activity parameter. And it makes sense if the elasticity is, if, 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 if the system is very stiff, then this length scale is larger, because it's very hard <laughs> to really <laughs> battle the system. And the inverse dependent on the activity is also very well understood. I mean, if it's a system is very active, it is capable to, to, to introduce a lot of active stress and then to create uh, uh, structures at a very small level and that sense the active length scale should be reduced somehow. So the scaling makes sense. I mean, obviously from theoretical um, simulation, uh, sorry, from theoretical uh, analysis and simulation, this concept of an active length scale has been always there somehow. But it's interesting that in our case, in our case, Actually, we proved that this makes sense because we have changed, but this I will explain a little bit later, we have changed the parameters of the system, for example, the concentration of microtubules, the concentration of ATP, the concentration of PEG, the concentration of K-emissions, and we have interpreted, as I, I, I show it later, uh, that this scale really is there. This active length scale is, is, is there because we're controlling this, this experimental parameter. Somehow you imagine that you are tuning these material parameters. Although I have to say that the, a direct measure of these constants, or this k, for example, or alpha, in terms of the experimental parameters is out of reach, at least until now. We don't know exactly the way. But qualitative arguments uh, can, be, can be addressed. Now, bacterial turbo, sorry. Yeah. So, so so, sorry, F we, we apply this, this um, indicator, this occupied parameter, uh, after uh, having calculated the velocity fields, and then you, in this plot, I show you the distribution of these uh, regions of occupied negative, and this gives you somehow the area of the vortices. And this, I this is exactly an histogram so number of vortices in terms of the area of these vortices. Well, I don't know if it is the definition of active turbulence, but what is true is that these people predicted that for uh, active turbulence, at least in active pneumatic, you should find this exponential distribution. That's the prediction of the paper. And this is our experimental verification of this prediction. I don't know. I don't know if what is considered as active turbulence should always have this, but at least for active pneumatic, I will say that's the case. No, no. But here, wait, wait. I am not referring to plots of energy or spec or whatever. I am not referring to this. This is simple an histogram of the areas of this vertical of these vortices. You you mean to, to identify this? Well, um, maybe, maybe. Th I mean, we, we really, I, I have to admit, we really follow exactly. 
Yeah, no, that's true. But I have to tell you, I mean, we really follow the journeys uh, observable in that, I mean, we could do, actually, as I showed you before, we have some correlation functions, but we haven't analyzed them in detail. Yeah, 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 probably. I, I don't say. Yeah, right. What a special temporal chaos. Anyway. No, that's for sure. Now, uh, I, I skip this because this is uh, uh, just to, com to, s to say that there are many other, um, many other contexts where you can find this kind of active turbulence, for example, in, um, in bacteria, in uh, sperm, in cells, actually, very recent paper. And now, I will go to something that I think is a maybe a little bit more interesting. And the idea is to discern <laughs> the onset of this active turbulence. Because everybody refers to the active turbulence, but where does it come from? What is the origin? Or at least, could we provide with a route <laughs> to turbulence, to active turbulence? And uh, in principle, if you think a little bit on it, it's, it's a little bit difficult because as I said, you preserve the system in the 3D phase as an active gel, and then you deplete to the interface. And when you deplete it, automatically the system is very somehow irregular or is disordered by itself from the very beginning. So the idea to create a very well-defined initial condition where you could see or could you could fetch the onset of the of the turbulence, it's uh, in principle, seems to be very complicated. But if you think a little bit more, then you find a situation which can be really addressed in a very robust way, and it's very clever. Actually, it was a little bit of serendipity, <laughs> and, and Bertha could confirm this, because he, she is behind this project. It was a little bit by chance that we discovered this. But th the intervention is the simplest one you can imagine. Look, imagine you prepare your system as normal, in the normal way, and then you just place a tube, a capillary tube, and you induce somehow a flow into the tube. With this simple intervention, what you manage is to orient the material, you align the material gradually towards this open end of the micro tube, ah, so of the micro tube, sorry, of the capillary tube. And then, once you are in this situation, you just remove the, the tube and you let the system evolve. It's that simple. And this is what happens. This video shows you at this point is the tube and then you remove it. And this is what you get. Did you get it? <laughs> um, initially, initially the system. I show you. I show you another time. Okay. I mean, I, I recognize that maybe it's not the best video we have. But I think we have a little bit better. But anyway, uh, I repeat it in another uh, in another way. So in that video, you will see not the initial a stage of instability, but some already, uh, I will say not advanced, but after some transient. Look at it. You see some kind of arrays or whatever of lines with the material very well aligned somehow. And then you will see what happens. Is what I will show you in this video is the repetition, is the, the you know, the, the, the the, the, yeah, the repetition of this kind of instability, and I show you it here. So you see, now you will see that the system gets 
Let's stabilize in the perpendicular direction, and then this repeats sometimes three or four times up to the completely, uh, up until the initial alignment is completely fade away, and you get this kind of very complicated and very turbulent structure. So our idea is that this instability, sorry, this active turbulence, or at least a situation, I don't say always, but a way to describe this active turbulence is saying, okay, this active turbulence comes from the an initial instability of uh, a line material. Now, this has been studied in a project with uh, Bertha in terms of Fourier analysis. Uh, Bertha, do you want to say something about that? Just very briefly, here. It's what you have done for the last year. Please, Bertha, do it. <laughs> but only maybe two minutes. <laughs> Go. O or maybe from here. I I could you do from here? Well, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Come here, doesn't matter. Please, Bertha, <laughs> come to the stage and explain to everybody what you have done. She has done an, an enormous amount of work because she, because she has analyzed this instability under a complete set of different experimental conditions. I will show you later. Okay, Bertha, go ahead. Oh, no, come on. No, I can try, I can try. So, um, needs to be recorded. Now? Do you hear me? Okay. Um, okay. I will use the cupboard because I think that it's much easier. So, as you see, I, as you saw in the previous slide, we have this kind of patterns. So, what we do is we transfer this to, well, um, to win perform, a, uh, perform an FFT analysis. So, you would have something like this. Well, with many points here and maybe here uh, and we measure the amplitude of the FFT and we look this over time because finally when you have the final state with turbulence you just see noise so you will have many points um, and this is what you see here yeah that's it sometimes so when because this is these are experiments so anything well nothing is perfect here <laughs> so sometimes you just see like a piece of here, so um, you wouldn't have this radial, um, this thing, <laughs> so you would have something like this. So what we do is um, we just measure the amplitude of the wave numbers of in the FFT and, and yeah, that's it. Uh, and then, well, and you also see that there is like a characteristic wave number, which which corresponds to the one we see here, and we see how it evolves. So here you would have all the wave numbers with time and the amplitude, and you see here this um, red region, which corresponds to this one, okay? And then you see that it evolves like this, with time, yeah, that's it. So if you take this one, which is the characteristic wave number, you see how it evolves in time and you get this. And finally, we track the, the growth rate, just plotting, yeah, just doing an, yeah, an exponential. And that's oh. it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, Here? Yeah, yeah, more or less. I mean, so we, what we usually do is we take like, um, so here if you have this radial, we make like an average, so you can take or you can extract the wave number. If, was this your question? No, well, we just, yeah, we just take the average, the average.
exactly what, what Bert explained to you is essentially the practical realization of the linear spectric analysis. <laughs> uh, a linear spectric analysis just um, uh, describing this sort of instability, pre very initial instability of practicism. Please. We don't press, we don't press, we just, um, the, the, the flow the f the f with, the with a tubular, with a capillary um, tube, you somehow uh, make uh, mm, a flow going into the capillary. So it's just an entrainment. It's not pressing, it's not applying a pressure, uh, or it's applying a depth pressure, let's say, somehow. Yes, yes, right, exactly, of course, right, yes, exactly, exactly. And I think it will be just following the, symm the symmetry of the, the circular geometry of the system. That's what I imagine. At least at the beginning, when you remove it, then the system is, is free to evolve. Anyway, since I think I am just, no, pretty much end, at the end, I just show you this amount of different experiments where we have compute this K max, this uh, uh, wave number of the most unstable mode and the growth rate of this most unstable mode. And we have done this by changing different parameters, like ATP, streptavidin, microtubules, and polyethylene glycol. And I will explain this tomorrow but essentially we have an argument to show that this, what we, ha what we show here is just an instability which is well known for uh, a stencil ordered active material predicted already by Boisselier and many others many years ago. And what we have done here is just to capture it from the beginning and from that we have ob obtained some dispersion relation. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I, 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 I finish tomorrow a little bit more. Thank you very much.